Let's go. Get here. Let's go. Get here right now. Get here. Hey, we got 30 minutes for the rest of our life. College football is the American game. It's a game of contradictions. A game that contains multitudes. A beautiful game. Oh my, what a catch by Fitzgerald. Oh mercy. And a violent one. Boy, did he unload on him, and that is the danger that you face when you... A game of rebels... Johnny Football! ...and magicians. Colin Murray's showing off the wheels! He's the guy you gotta hit him! Taskmasters... Are you getting blizzard? Damn it, I'm tired of it. ...and machines. The Crimson Tide will not be denied! A game that venerates the old... Paul Bear Bryant goes out a winner. And still finds room for the new. A game ruled by giants. We tied, but watch it. But in love with underdogs. Deep strike. Touchdown. Texas Tech upsets the number one team in the country. A game where generations have faced racism and faced it down. The first time that ball is snapped, you gotta knock hell out of him and let him know one thing, that boy, you gonna be in trouble this evening. You got a good man in front of you. Come on, come on! A game where a young man can risk it all for a chance to live forever. We got Let's 30 go. minutes! Let's go! For the rest of our lives! For the rest of our lives! Let's go! Let's go! This is college football. And football is us. The United States is the only country in the world where universities also run sports businesses. College football is a multi-billion dollar industry. The money's gotten to the point where it's almost unfathomable. And it does make you think, like, why are, why are colleges the ones who are doing this? The thing that you have to understand is we're not the most important thing. You know, we always come up with that house analogy. The porch is not the most important part of the, of the house, but it is the most visible. And you have to take care of that porch, so this is what people think your house looks like. Shot to the end zone, drops in, Jalen Rager, touchdown! The fortunes of a university are thought to be so tied to its football program that in 31 of the 50 states, the highest paid public employee is a state university football coach. When you open up USA Today, there isn't a whole section on the chemistry department. There is a whole section on sports. Why not let football gather the attention that can help fund all of it? All right, here we go. It's got, no, does not have the leg. And Chris Davis takes it to the back of the end zone. He'll run it out to the 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 45. There goes Davis. Oh, my God. Davis is going to run it all the way back. Auburn's going to win the football game. They're not going to keep him off the field tonight. Holy cow. Oh, my God. When you're a student and you're going to one of these schools, you feel such loyalty toward that program. You feel like it's a part of you. It's part of your identity. Rogers along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of, the ball is still loose as they get it to Rogers. They give it back down to the 30. They're down to the 20. All the fans is out on the field. He's gonna go to the end. No, he's got it to the other field. Get back, have one. Oh my God. The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, 
Park Rundy. Exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football. That notion of like the Flutie effect, where Doug Flutie goes to Boston College, leads them to a great season, and applications just go through the roof to BC. Flutie flushed, throws it down. Caught by Boston College. I don't believe it. Oh. It's a touchdown. <laughs> the Eagles win it. That's a real thing. It's like you get your name out there more, there are going to be more kids who are going to say, oh, looks like a cool place to go to school. The idea that if you build a program, they will come is an old one in college football. William Rainey Harper, the founding president of the University of Chicago, sets out to build a university with Rockefeller Millions in 1892. One of his first hires was a guy named Amos Alonzo Stagg to come in and build a football program. And what was hugely controversial was he brought Stagg in not only to coach the football program, but he paid him a full professor's salary. One of college football's founding principles had been the amateur ideal which held that no participant, player, or coach in college football would ever be paid. By taking money to help students play football better, Amos Alonzo Stagg changed the sport forever. Stagg is the first tenured football coach in the United States. And Stagg very quickly builds one of the best football teams in the country. Stagg's enormous success at Chicago created the blueprint for building a university on the shoulders of a football coach. It didn't take long for the idea to spread. In fact, it was just a few hours east by steam engine to South Bend, Indiana, where another small college harbored its own national ambitions. And a young immigrant named Newt Rockney saw coaching college football as his ticket to the American dream. There were famous coaches before Rockney, and, and definitely some very good coaches before Rockney, but nobody became famous in the way that Rockney became famous. He was the first true celebrity coach. Don't forget, man, we're gonna get him on a run, we're gonna go, 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 and we aren't gonna stop until we go to our goal line. Don't forget, man, today is the day we're gonna win. They can't lick it, and the black out of the goal. The first was let a man win there. Fight, 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 fight. What do you say, man? <laughs> Notre Dame was this utterly insignificant little Catholic school in South Bend, Indiana, that became a national phenomenon through the football team with Newt Rockney as coach. Untied and undefeated in 1919. Untied and undefeated in 1920. 1924, untied and undefeated. They became front page news. To this day, Newt Rockney has the highest winning percentage of any major college football coach who ever lived. But maybe more importantly, no coach was ever better at public relations. The 1920s saw the first media revolution of the 20th century. Newsreels that for the first time brought moving images of the country's great achievers to audiences all over America. It isn't necessary to see a good tackle, you can hear it. Tackling requires leg drive, courage, and fine judgment of timing and distance. That's all. Then a new invention, radio, brought live sporting events to fans. And Notre Dame's games reached the living rooms of Americans coast to coast. Marty Brill takes the ball and a fake pass. Gets off that tackle. For the first time, the entire country could experience a college football game all at once, live, as it happened. And it wasn't long before fans across the country came to associate the very sport with the name Rockney. It wasn't just that the media happened around Rockney, as Rockney recognized in the media an opportunity to promote his, his university and his football team, but, but particularly to promote himself. There was no newsreel camera that he wasn't ready to welcome onto campus and, you know, perform for them. There's been a lot of talk by some of our famous educators and some of the pseudo-intelligentsia on overemphasis in football. I studied Coach Rogney quite a bit. 
And it wasn't just that it was a great football coach. He sold his program a lot like coaches today sell. That was so far beyond, you know, before anyone else's time that he became bigger than life. Rockney watched anxiously, but he need not have worried. Notre Dame won the game decisively. Rockney was welcomed back to South Bend with a victory parade. He was now one of the great coaches of his time. He was an absolutely brilliant self-promoter. He cultivated sports writers. He cultivated Grantland Rice. Grantland Rice was the country's most famous sports writer. And when Notre Dame beat Army in 1924, Rice turned Rockney and his players into the stuff of myth. Our backfield of 1924 was called the Four Horsemen by Grantland Rice and thereby achieved immortality in football circles. Rockney achieved a kind of immortality himself. In 1931, he was killed tragically in a plane crash, and he was eulogized as a national hero in books and movies, coming to forever represent the standard most coaches aspire to, the clever tactician, the master motivator, and the larger-than-life figure. Rocky said, sometime when the team is up against it and the brakes are beating the boys, Tell them to go out there with all they got and win just one for the Gipper. But what are we waiting for? <laughs> College football players come in waves. Masses of young men with identities hidden under helmets, arriving and then leaving campus in just a few short years. So the face of college football has always been the coach. And for most of the game's history, the coach was a domineering ruler whose word was law, in whom all faith was placed by fan and player alike. Americans have always worshiped toughness. And at the same time, we've always worried about losing our toughness. About the country becoming. The cult of toughness goes all the way back to the origins of college football, which began just a few years after the Civil War ended. The devastation of that conflict was immense, as the thought emerged that the sacrifices the war had demanded might have done us some good. There's this period of prosperity in America, and there was this worry that, that men were going to get soft. American men were being urged to seek out what the philosopher William James would come to call the moral equivalent of war. One autumn afternoon in 1869, 50 college students from Rutgers and Princeton found it. The first college football game it had 25 players on a side, and you advanced the ball by kicking or batting it through the other team, but you couldn't pick up the ball and run with it. One point was scored for getting the ball across the goal line, and Rutgers won six to four. The game spread quickly among the elite colleges of the Northeast. Football became part of this plan, one, one of the terms of muscular Christianity, to sort of build up men to be tough. To the privileged young men who were being trained to lead the growing country, college football became part of a national mission. If colleges exist only to teach Latin and Greek, an educator wrote, they might as well close. But if colleges exist to make men, football is the most important part of the course. One player at Yale saw football as a way to create a nation of clean, strong bodies and pure minds. That player's name was Walter Camp. Walter Camp, even in, in his own day, was referred to as the father of, of American football. American football had to undergo a huge transformation to become the game that we understand it. Well, the guy who led that transformation was Walter Camp. Camp wanted football to be what he called organized war, 
He created positions, introduced the line of scrimmage, and invented the concept of down and distance. College football exploded in popularity. By 1893, crowds at games grew to as large as 40,000. But Camp's game had one problem baked in. Since the forward pass was illegal, the only way to advance the ball was by running with it. This created, you know, just total mayhem. So-called mass play, where you'd have your heaviest guys slamming into the line play after play. Well, you know, people were getting battered. Camp shrugged. Better to make a boy an outdoor savage than an indoor weakling, he said. And the fact that, that it resulted in broken limbs and concussions, you know, he accepted as a, an unfortunate but necessary, you know, consequence of, of the game he loved. The biggest hurdle college football had to overcome was this simple notion of does it belong? Does this brutal, savage activity belong at the most elite institutions in the country? Does it have anything to do with the academic endeavors at those institutions? That's the big hurdle. Teddy Roosevelt wrote that he would a hundredfold rather keep the game as it is now with the brutality than give it up. At the University of Chicago, school president William Rainey Harper went even further. If the world can afford to sacrifice the lives of men for commercial gain, Harper wrote, it can much more easily afford to make similar sacrifices upon the altar of vigorous and unsullied manhood. There was a sense of romanticization of the almost a, a Romans versus Christians aspect of it, because it was extremely violent. And the aspect of the game that the media focused on was the violence because that, that was the heart of the matter. The portrayal of the college football hero came to be indistinguishable from the war hero. And with good reason, as the number of colleges playing football increased, so did fatalities on the field. 1905, the year of crisis, we might call it. In 1905, there's something like 18 young men who die on college football fields around the United States. Football is in deep trouble. Guys are basically running over the defenses and literally killing people. So something had to be done to fix it. And it's just coincidental, but it's, it's a lovely coincidence that Theodore Roosevelt's son, Ted Jr., was a freshman on the Harvard team who got badly beaten up in, in, in the Yale game, and so you know, images of Ted Jr. on the sports pages. What does the president think about this? And Theodore Roosevelt summoned the leaders of the football programs at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton to the White House and said, if you don't clean up this sport, do something about the violence, the public will rise up against it and, and you'll lose the game altogether. Soon, the case for reform became inescapable. There's a day in November of 1905 when Harold Moore, player for Union College in New York, he dies on the field in a game against New York University. And the chancellor of NYU, Henry McCracken, he says, not only is it bad for the health of our students, but this is actually bad for the reputations of our universities. We need to do something about it. And that's, you know, a month later, people meet in New York City and create the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States, which today we know is the NCAA. The changes led to something closer to the game played today. Most importantly, by legalizing the forward pass. We can't imagine football without the forward pass, but it's not legal until 1906. The idea when they legalize the forward pass is this is going to open the game up. It's going to make it safer. What we had for, for decade after decade after decade was, you know, kind of attempts to calibrate how much violence is okay. 
The very fact that there is a rule against unnecessary roughness means that there is a necessary roughness. Every generation has tried to make the game safer, from requiring helmets in 1939 to making headfirst tackling illegal in 2008. But college football has remained violent because the people who play it and the people who watch it want it that way. You take hits because sometimes, as crazy as it sounds, you love being hit. That kind of gets you going a little bit. Football's a violent game. I mean, there's nothing you can do. It's like trying to take the wet from water, the cold from snow. You can't take the violence out of football. It's like it still feels like this bastion of masculinity, for better or for worse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hit somebody in the mouth! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! I think that's, that's just baked into what football is from 1869 on. There was the biggest hit maybe of the 1989-90 bowl season. I think. You know, if you if you walk into a stadium in, in Tuscaloosa or Norman or Austin, there is still a lot of the sense that I want to see somebody get hit today. Michigan at the 41. What a hit! I still think that a great hit, violent as it is, is a thing of beauty. It's a violent physical game, and uh, we all know there's consequences in a game like that. And there's a chance that you're going to pay a price for it physically. Now we all know that this great game it takes a terrible toll the concussion problem in football isn't new in 1933 an NCAA medical handbook described the condition known as punch drunk and said it was caused by recurrent concussions what is new is the scope of the problem we always thought what we were doing was how to protect players bodies adequately now we know that the dangers are so much greater than we ever imagined and so much more insidious. And so we are at a real tough place right now. Now we're going to go to a troubling new study about the risk of brain injury in football. The way to frame the question is, how safe can football be and still be football? Between technology, diagnosis, I mean, we need to do everything we can to make it as safe as possible. I don't think taking hitting out of the game is one of those things. So it's like taking driving out of auto racing, or it's like taking bats out of baseball, you know? I mean, I, I, there's no sense in it. Well, if you're gonna do that. <laughs> Can you imagine that ESPN? Gonna, we're gonna have a touch football game in the Cotton Bowl today between Texas and Oklahoma. How many people do you think would show up for that on TV or live? None. The NCAA has put in place new restrictions on hitting, new concussion protocols, new helmet technology. Some people believe the changes are already having a positive effect. It's forced us to take a hard look at this and change our teaching methods and styles and change the game for the better. You kind of looking light on those feet this morning. I remember like it's yesterday when we were in coaches' meetings and they're talking about how this type of tackling and using your head is going to be illegal now. And coaches is almost like rioting and going, well, I don't know how to coach then. And I'm thinking, well, you need to figure it out or go coach something else because this is where it's going. Overemphasize knee bend. Ready, go. Strike it. Strike it. You gonna try bend your knees? I like it, Trav. And so I think about how we practice and how much safer it is. Uh -huh. And would I be okay with my son being out there, being coached like this, and what we're trying to get him to do? And I, I and I would be.
we all have got to do soul searching about what we feel about this game. And I've not come up with an answer. There are so many bargains that we make with ourselves to be able to justify watching this sport in the first place. That's just another one now that you have to think about and, and try not to think about, you know, and hope that there's that a solution is going to come along. It's troublesome, but no, I'm, I'm not going Howard Cosell in the 80s, divorcing myself from boxing. I, I, I still think it's a great game and, and, and I'm not walking out on it yet. If we love college football despite its inherent dangers, it's because it isn't just a brutal game. It's also a beautiful one. Sanders spit! Sanders has a chance! He could go all the way! The essence of football is not only violence, it's violence in tension with artistry or beauty. The exhilaration of a Barry Sanders run or a Johnny Manziel scramble is the thrill of watching a man escape certain physical harm. A never-ending duel between violence and beauty. That beauty often wins. You watch like Carla Murray. Just being able to run away from these guys who are twice his size and who are bearing down on him like, like a couple of giant trucks, you know? It's being able to create that beauty in the face of imminent annihilation that is the essence of football. During the late 1800s, when college football was taking root in America, college itself was still the province of the elite. Less than 2% of all students went on to college at all. And of that 2%, less than 1% were African American. But of that tiny segment of the population, there were men who would challenge the social order. William Henry Lewis played at Amherst as an undergrad and at Harvard as a law student. And he was voted team captain at both schools. Walter Camp named him to his all-time All-American team. And after graduating law school, Lewis became a coach at Harvard. This led to a great friendship with Harvard's number one fan and football dad, President Teddy Roosevelt. But it also led to a backlash that foretold the hateful opposition that African Americans would face for generations. This illustration appeared in 1904 in one of America's most popular publications, Life Magazine. The artist was James Montgomery Flagg, the same man who a decade later drew Uncle Sam. I talk about this in the classroom and my students look at me like I'm crazy and then I throw like quotes up on the board about Anglo-Saxon supremacy and anxieties around white manhood and the ordering of the races, where white men need to be on the top of the social hierarchy and one way they can showcase their supremacy is on the gridiron. In the first half of the 20th century, the social hierarchy was maintained by keeping black players out of the game. Southern football was completely segregated, and teams in the rest of the country almost never had more than one or two black players, if any at all. On the field, Black players were often targeted by white opponents. In 1951, Drake's Johnny Bright was the nation's leading rusher and a contender to become the first black player to win the Heisman when his team traveled to Oklahoma A&M. There's jealousy there. There's racial jealousy. Uh, there's a chip on their shoulder. There's talk in the town that the black guy's not going to last the whole game, right? Media are sending photographers there because they're anticipating something's going to go down, um, and it did. On the first play of the game, he was brutally attacked. There's no other way to put it. I mean, his jaw was shattered.
It was a racist attack. And it became a national scandal after the Des Moines Register published a photo sequence of the assault that would win the Pulitzer Prize. Despite his injuries, Bright was still named second team All-American. And it was performances like his that pushed more schools around the country to integrate their teams. Michigan State, for instance, became a national powerhouse in the 1960s when coach Duffy Doherty recruited a host of great black players, including defensive end Bubba Smith. Segregation meant that they couldn't play in Austin or Tuscaloosa, so they ended up in East Lansing instead. A lot of guys from the South, you know, uh, they were sort of the Underground Railroad to Michigan State. A similar approach turned Oklahoma and Nebraska into two of the nation's most dominant teams. At Nebraska, Coach Bob Devaney said he was going to recruit more African Americans than anybody else in history and let them play. Rogers takes the ball at the 30. He's hit and got away. Back up field to the 35 to the 40. Oklahoma was our toughest opponent. They had blackbirds ever playing. When a black athlete came here, he knew he was going to get in the huddle. He's going to see his brothers up there in front of him playing guard, center. But I'm recruiting the best players at all positions. Get ready, let's get ready, let's get ready. While college football in most of the country was integrating, in the South, there was resistance. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> George Wallace was the governor, and it was a it was a very combustive, explosive time in the state. Racial tension, segregation, violence. Alabama football became that thing that white people could at least latch onto to feel good about themselves. People in Alabama didn't view the racism and the bigotry that existed there and that permeated the culture there the same way because they were so angry with the way they had been portrayed this is an unlawful assembly you have to disperse you are ordered to disperse go home or go to your church that they couldn't see right in front of them and they didn't view it objectively. They viewed it uh, through a prism of, well, what about you? Alabama coach Paul Bear Bryant was the embodiment of Southern football. Here you go, here you go. Big Tampa's come out of there and throw. Come on, let's go. And white Southerners clung to his all-white teams in the 60s as symbolic sources of pride. In particular, Alabama's three national championship teams. I wouldn't trade place with anyone in the world because of the privilege of being here at the university in the capacity in which I'm in. And Win, lose, or draw, I think they will represent you well. While a few Southern teams began to recruit African-American players in the mid-60s, Alabama did not. But by the end of the decade, Bryant's all-white team had become mediocre. The push for desegregation in big-time football was just simply talent. It was not driven by this humanitarian kind of thing. It looked racism in the face and said, you may not like black folks, but if you want to compete nationally, nationally, you're going to need them. Bryant signed his first black player, Wilbur Jackson, December 1969. Now you're seeing the real Alabama team. By 1973, Jackson helped Alabama reclaim the number one ranking in the country. Had the South not integrated, they would have disappeared as a football region. Uh, it just wasn't tenable anymore. 
The desegregation of major college football in the South was a huge boon to formerly all-white schools and to black players who were no longer denied, just because of the color of their skin, the opportunity to play on the game's biggest stages. But it didn't leave everyone better off. The interesting thing about integration, I guess you could celebrate that, but then you at what cost? At what cost? Desegregation was always done in terms that benefited the white power establishment. Broke you down, but take your best to make us strong and eliminate the competition. For decades, historically black colleges and universities were a haven for African-American players, particularly Southern black players who weren't allowed to play for schools like Alabama, Florida, or Texas. While HBCUs had limited financial resources, their teams regularly featured some of the country's best players. Integration changed all that. In American society, integration takes place in the hands of white institutions. Major college football integration begins to look like that in the sense of sort of, you know, not bringing HBCU teams into your conference, but instead just sort of allowing more and more elite black players into your programs and not caring that HBCU programs might suffer or eventually die because of that. HBCUs had always been part of what made college football great. Black colleges started playing the game in the early 1890s and by the 1920s produced stars like Ben Stevenson, a devastating running back for Tuskegee. Like the sport as a whole, HBCU football was dominated by high-powered coaches, Hall of Famers like Jake Gaither at Florida A&M and Eddie Robinson at Grambling, the first college coach to win 400 games. In order for us to have, you got to put strength on strength and let weakness go to hell. Now, this is what you can have to do. And they were able to draw on an immense pool of talented players. Let's get off. Let's get off. When you're talking about historical black college, they never got to do that they so rightly deserve. You can't tell me the players that we had to come out of the historical black schools was not better or as good as the guys back in those days who was thought of as Heisman Trophy candidates. By the 1960s, it was impossible to ignore how good HBCU football had become. In 1963, the Kansas City Chiefs took Grambling's Buck Buchanan with the first pick in the draft. And over the next 15 years, more than 500 HBCU players were drafted, including some of the best players in pro football history. Alabama, all the schools in the Southeastern Conference who were saying that, you know, blacks weren't good enough to play, which is why Grambling was loaded. Why Texas Southern was loaded, why Prairie View was loaded, why Tennessee State was loaded. The first time that ball is snapped, you gotta knock hell out of him and let him know one thing. That boy, you gonna be in trouble this evening. And the type of ball player you are, you should try to take his head off his shoulder. I mean, you know, I mean, this was an era when Grandley was producing more players in the pros than Notre Dame. This was a golden era for black college football. In 1968, HBCU football fell sober into mainstream prominence, and Grambling and Morgan State ventured up north for the first time to play a game in the country's biggest market and most famous stadium. I was one of uh, three freshmen who made the Morgan State football team, and this was like a, this was like a huge deal. To go to Yankee Stadium, my first college football game, we went through Harlem, it was just a whole thing. And you gotta remember 1968, Dr. King got assassinated. There were like riots everywhere. This was that time, everything, whether it was a football game, or whatever, everything was about race. And it flowed into everything you did. So 
We all knew that there was more at stake. And I remember we went out there for pregame warm-ups. And there was like, you know, people were just coming in, it was just milling in. Big Yankee State was kind of empty. And so we said, oh man, okay, well, you know, what's this about? But it was still just a big deal just to be there. Then we went back inside, you know, to put our stuff on and all that. And then it was time to go out. And I remember going out, and all of a sudden, the place, there were 63,000 people there, and it was unbelievable. There was like the Grambling Band, the Morgan Band. And when we came out, the place went nuts. And none of us had ever seen these many people before. And these are all black folks in the stands. It was remarkable. It was the most emotional moment I'd been a part of because people knew this big deal, not only for us, but for black college football. It all merged. This was a black, black power, black pride, black consciousness. And the fact that we filled it up, we sold it out. And we had put on this great show. But just as HBCU football was finally getting its moment in the sun, the foundations of its success were about to be eroded by DSEC. When we talk about this celebration of the Morgan Grambling game and how great it was because all this talent was on display, well, that was great, but it also became a problem, and that became, you know, the, the beginning of the end of this sort of black dominance. Tell the back where he's going, James. Let's go. All right, let's go. All right, come on. Hurry. And all these great players, we kind of had to ourselves. Now, all of a sudden, you began to be recruiting against institutions that you really couldn't really recruit against, all these big white institutions. Rutley, outside to Nathan. He scores! By the end of the 1970s, the starters on Bear Bryant's formerly all-white Alabama team were 40% black, and he'd won three more national championships. By 1979, the handwriting was on the wall. It was over. The more the previously all-white schools integrated, the less the top black players across the country were drawn to HBCUs. The era of great HBCU football was done. Since the decline of HBCUs, college football has come to be dominated by formerly all-white schools of the South. 12 of the last 13 national champions are from the South. And the irony is, it's all been accomplished with players they resisted allowing in for so long. It's gonna be black labor, white wealth. We're gonna take your best your most valuable people, and put them into our institutions to make us stronger, and at the same time, make yours crumble. And that became the model of integration. All we're asking you to give it what you got and try to do what we know how to do. Now, let's get after it. Come on. Let's go. Let's get after it. College football is an unfair game. Many schools have massive budgets, fancy facilities, and access to the country's best players. Many do not. Good programs attract great players. Good players want to go where good things happen, you know, be recognized for it. You have an advantage, it gives you an advantage. For the 25th consecutive year, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas is a complete sellout for the Oklahoma-Texas battle. It was during the 1960s and 70s that elite teams really concentrated their power, thanks in large part to television. Nearly 72,000 fans jammed in here today on a perfect afternoon for football. Before you had what I used to call the TV aristocracy, Notre Dame, Alabama, USC, 
NCAA college football, number one ranked Southern California, meet their traditional rivals, the Bruins of UCLA. Through the 1970s, the NCAA didn't allow individual programs or conferences to sell their own TV rights. And they rarely allowed more than one national game per week. So TV games almost always featured the country's best known and most successful programs. Davis! Touchdown! Scarcity creates power, right? So there was this tremendous scarcity of product. Out of that, there comes this mythology. There was Bear Bryant, Joe Paterno, John McKay, Touchdown Jesus, dotting the eye. Their de facto TV monopoly gave famous programs more of a recruiting edge than ever. And they simply overpowered everyone else. But that very unfairness sparked a burst of innovation on the part of upstart schools that found new ways to do more with less. Little schools get of athletes that are small that are really talented, but they're not big enough to play big time. Because in big time, you run over people, you don't run around them or do any of that kind of stuff, because that's un-American. But when you put those same little guys, a big guy that can't fly as fast, the flyers go to the end zone, and the big guys are chasing them. At Division II Portland State, Mouse Davis introduced the run and shoot, a pass-first system at a time when smash-mouth football dominated the game. If you have never witnessed Portland State University football, you're in for a sports treat. Our approach was, we're going to pass first. And you spread people out, you open the holes, so that you could get maximum space for your receiver to win. And then score, score, score. Portland State once scored 15 touchdowns in a game. And in 1980, they averaged 435 yards passing. Our offense is so unique, we just don't run set patterns. We read the defenses. And when that happens, good things happen. As you know, we led the nation in the last five years in total offense and passing. Beef, beef. Hurry, 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 hurry out of there. A couple of years later, another Maverick coach at another tiny school came up with his own radical take on the passing game. The coach was Archie the Gunslinger Cooley. The school was Mississippi Valley State, and the offense was the Satellite Express. A no-huddle attack featuring quarterback Willie Totten and a wide receiver who would become the greatest of all time, Jerry Rice. They threw the ball 90% of the time. No one else in collegiate football or professional football, they were running that type of scheme. I don't know where he got this from, but you know, he had this vision. Everybody to the right. You know, to be honest with you, I thought it was like, it was a little crazy at first. Like, you know, like that looks real, real stupid. Cooley designed plays out of formations no one had imagined before. I quickly caught on to what Archie Cooley, what he was trying to accomplish. Then I said, wow, this is really going to be big. In Jerry Rice's senior year, he set NCAA single season records for receiving the Delta Devils, averaged 640 yards and 61 points a game. It was one of the greatest offensive displays in college football history. What's distinctive about college football is that its popularity is not a popularity that is arbitrary or, or purely um, a, a consequence of, of commercialism. Right? It, it's a popularity that is a consequence of deep human need. College football is about being part of a community, being part of something that's larger than oneself. It's an institution in which religious sentiments, religious feelings can be experienced. I went to Tuscaloosa, Baton Rouge, Athens. Every place I went, I could see examples in which 
people who are experiencing this kind of sacred dimension. You show up to campus, which is itself a sacred space. There is the team walk through the crowd to the stadium. The band then comes soon afterwards. It's just the same game after game. That's ritual, right? It's this repeated activity that, that has meaning to people. You get into the stadium, which is a particularly sacred space. The field, of course, is the most sacred of spaces. The time during which the game is being played is the most sacred of times. It is about that sense of transcendence. During that football game, I will experience moments in which I transcend myself. I'm no longer self-conscious. I am so completely immersed in the moment. There's a famous anthropologist who wrote about this distinction between structure and communitas. Societies need people who are going to be doctors, people who are going to come by with the trash. Everybody has a role, and that's the structure. But for societies to be healthy, we need those moments where we transcend the structure and we become one with one another. Human beings have been trying to achieve that for millennia. In the past, we would describe it in specifically religious terms. Today, a lot of people don't find it in institutional religion, so they have to find it in other places. And college football is one of them. It's not just about the success of the team, it's the connection with the values that the team represents. The determination of the players. We gotta play football today, man! Let's go! We gotta play college football! The loyalty that they have to the institution. The skill, the dedication that they show to their craft. and the sacrifices that they make. We often use that word and forget the fact that that's a deeply religious term, this idea of sacrifice. Uh, I'm all right. He's all right, he's all right, he's all right, he's all right. And 34 is down! Four to Mike! Can I go? And the fact that there is somebody on that field representing us. And they're willing to sacrifice their bodies so that we, and I do mean we, we can win and experience that joy and that exuberance and that excitement and that transcendence. As college football fans, we should be deeply appreciative. When it boils down to it, you just want to be on the field competing because you love doing it. You play the game because you love it. Oh, love. Love is the strongest form of motivation. Why does a true soldier fight? It's not for the hatred of those in front of him. It's for the love of those behind him. And that's the essence of college football. I love going on the field and do battle with my teammates on that Saturday. So I think when you look at it overall, it's the love of the game no matter what. I think you have to be able to hold two opposing ideas in your head when you're a college football fan, which is that the way that we're idolizing 19-year-old kids is unhealthy. The way that we are idolizing football coaches and paying them $5 million a year is unhealthy. But it's also just like, this is what brings people together as a people. And it makes them feel like they have something. Whoa, he has trouble with the snap, and the ball is free! It's picked up by Michigan State's Jalen Watts-Jackson, and he scores! 
Raiders on the last play of the game. Unbelievable. There's just something beautiful about the way these games unfold and the way that they feel. It's just the feel of college football is different from anything I, I ever experienced in my life. I always, you know, laugh when people say, "What well, is it too important? Well, no, it's not too important. Uh, I mean, I'd rather somebody be uh, overzealous about uh, their passion than to have no feeling whatsoever. And college football, it is special. Braxton Miller's loose spin move. Miller headed for the end zone. The fans that are in the stands and, and they're playing the game right along with you. I mean, when you can go out and you can touch someone and bring so much excitement to that person on that given day and just have them forget everything that's bad and just to enjoy that moment. That's the reason why collegiate football, you know, it's a special game and it's something that I love doing. And it runs Howard back up. I don't know whether it's primal or what, but people admire strength and courage. And a football player in college personifies that. It takes courage to play the game. It takes real loyalty. It takes dedication to a team. And so there's a lot to admire about the people who play the game. We hand it off to Herschel. There's a hole. Five, ten. Oh, you Herschel Walker. Who keeps it, avoids one man at midfield, 45, 40, 35, 30, there goes Cam, 15, 10, 5, dive! How about Barry Sanders? To midfield, he may go! College football is so deeply flawed, but it's also really beautiful. Rocket, here he goes! Goodbye! That's it. The 40. That's it. Still going. That's why it's. I, it always feels to me like a reflection of America. Ten on the run. Look at that power. Touchdown.